So we're now here in the operations control center with Glenn. So Glenn, this is the backbone of where everything happens, right? Yeah, effectively think of this as being mission control. Yep. When we talk about the deep space network, we're always thinking about it as being air traffic control for space or the post office for the universe. Okay. So all of the data that flows in from our spacecraft across the solar system comes through our antennas, it's processed through this room yep. and most of the rest of the building, which is computer processing systems, to be able to take all of that tiny radio signal yep. coming from billions of kilometres away and to be able to relay that straight off to the science teams at the Jet Propulsion Labs and other science teams all over the planet. So essentially, once they come into the dishes that we were just looking at, they kind of are managed here and then they're sent back out, right? Yeah, effectively. So we do the initial step of processing on site, and that processing is really eliminating random radio noise, okay. the junk mail of the universe, <laughs> okay. if you like. And there's just, a lot of junk mail, There's right? a lot of junk mail. It's a noisy universe out there. So just keeping the signal coming from the spacecraft, taking that okay. data out of the carrier signal, processing it, and getting that clean signal off to the science teams. Excellent. Now, are you, what are you actually controlling when you're in here? Are you physically moving the dish? Are you changing the frequencies, pointing at a different spacecraft? Okay, so you get a mission team. Let's start the process. Mission team will say, okay, what do we want our spacecraft to do today? Yep. Say a rover driving on the surface of Mars. Yep. So they'll write a little program. They'll then send that off to the Jet Propulsion Labs. So they'll send it to us, the yep. station that's gonna be handling that communication okay. run. Yep. We'll then encode it assign it to a particular antenna that has the capabilities to do it. So we need to assign antennas that have the frequency capability, yep. the receiving capability, yep. and all of the systems within this building that handle the processing of that data. Okay. Yep. And so then we'll allocate that in the appropriate time. The operators will also sync in the data to do the correct pointing. Yes, okay. Because it's all about distance and time That's right. when we're dealing with space. So we'll get the antenna, move it to the appointed position at the right time. We'll send the commands at the appointed time. So there's a schedule that's worked out, okay. very detailed, literally second by second of what needs to be done during that process. Yep. So the operators here are handling all of that kind of work. When we're in full track mode, yep. basically the computer systems take over. They're okay. handling because the Earth we know its rotation pretty well and our orbit around the sun pretty well so we can put that into an auto mode so they're always moving countering the planet's rotation and our orbit excellent now we've talked about a bit in this course already that we have to have multiple stations around the world because well the earth is a globe and if you want to contact spacecraft all around you need multiple places so how does Canberra work with the other stations in the JPL NASA Deep Space Network? Yeah, so as part of the Deep Space Network, there are three sites around the planet. So yep. we have our station here in Canberra, one in Spain, yep. and one in California, yep. separated by about 120 degrees each, one okay. third of the planet away from each other. Okay. So as Earth rotates, there's always one station that has complete view of every part of their sky to make a full 360 to see every part of the solar system and the universe around us. At every single time, because that's the key, right? Is to make sure nothing is forgotten about in space. Yeah, it's 24 hour operation. Spacecraft are in all directions. So you're not just handling what's in Canberra skies, it's what's happening in California, it's what's happening over in the Spanish side of the world. So you've got to have that 360 degree coverage. And it has to be a 24 hour, 24 7 operation because spacecraft never sleep. So effectively, neither do we. So, do you, so this is a 24 hour facility, people are working day and night no matter what? Yeah, there's always somebody in the operations control center, yep. but we don't have to have a full crew like we used to have many years ago in the early days of yep. space exploration. Because of remote operations now, oh, okay. what you can do is during daylight at each station, that station then runs the entire network. So the team behind us here, they're currently not only handling the antennas here, but operating the antennas in Spain and California at the same time. So they're, they're effectively kind of running the network or the bulk yeah. of the network. And I assume we choose the daytime because then people can have normal lives and sleep yeah, schedules. Yeah, it's actually done a great thing to change and improve people's lifestyle so that they can basically see their families grow up. And that's a really important <laughs> thing. Uh, but you've always, as I said, got somebody here because even if you have, say, somebody in Spain yep. operating our antennas here, you have to have somebody here to physically go and push a button or check a system ah, if something okay. does go wrong. Yep. So you always kind of have a, a, a fallback or a backup in case something's going wrong because you need to make sure it's working. And that's true right across space exploration. You have backups and you have backups to those backups. So in the operations control center, we have lots of dishes on this facility, plus around the network, as you said. But we also have lots of spacecraft on lots of planets and not planets as well. So, so how do we actually sort out and determine what is communicating and pointing at what and when? So it's all about scheduling. About a year ahead of, say, today, yep. 
somebody will have said, okay, on our mission, our particular day, we want to be able to have our spacecraft do this particular activity. Okay. Or it might be an orbital maneuver, it might be, you know, trajectory correction yep. uh, that needs to be done. Or for a vehicle is, you know, planning to land at yep. a particular place on a particular day. So that's always planned well ahead. Yep. Um, we have to build into the schedule not only the time for you know, uplinking signals, transmitting to a spacecraft and also receiving from a spacecraft. Uh, we might also be just doing general ranging, we might yep. be just general telemetry, just getting yep. just general data back from a spacecraft on its health. But also, we need to build in time for ourselves, time for maintenance on an antenna. Yep. You know, they've got to always be working, yep. so we've got to have that maintenance done. Uh, training, just like, say, an astronaut might train for a mission into space, yep. we have to train for every spacecraft that's out there. Because and every spacecraft's slightly different in terms of operation? Yeah. Every spacecraft is different. They all have their own computer personalities, okay. as it were. All right, all right. <laughs> and so we need to deal how we deal with different emergencies on different spacecraft. Oh, okay. So there's that's all right. those scenarios, and even for upcoming missions. Ah, so we're okay. training for future missions as they're about to come along. So how far in advance do you have to train for some of these missions? So some missions you might have almost two to three years in advance when oh, they okay. first start thinking about it. That's when we first start to know about a spacecraft, what acronyms we'll use some <laughs> are for those particular gotcha. systems. So every spacecraft and every mission science team is a little bit different around the world yep. because we're not just handling missions for NASA, of course. We're handling missions for 26 different nations at the moment. So you might be handling a mission for India or yep. Japan or any of the European nations or the United Arab Emirates. And very soon we're going to be handling missions with New Zealand. Yep. So they all talk, talk a totally different language to us. <laughs> no one's <laughs> going to understand it. Nobody's regardless. going to understand it at all. So we need to be able to do all of that. So the, the schedule has to take into account all of those sorts of factors. Okay. And then that can change over time. Mission plans change. Yes. Different events come along. New discoveries mean, well, we need different activities. So that can literally change right up to the day. Okay. And then you could have the totally unexpected as well, spacecraft emergencies. Yep. So a spacecraft might be hit by a cosmic gray or a solar flare and might put itself into safe mode. So we then need to take action here or any of the stations to swing an antenna into action on that particular spacecraft. And that means another mission loses their time, but they never mind that because they know another mission would give up the same for Th them. That's right, it's kind of a, we're all in the same celestial boat, so yeah, to speak, it's, together. It's yeah. literally the sailors in distress. If yeah. somebody's in distress, it doesn't matter where you are, you go and rescue. Yep. So do you, is there ever when you have a dish offline that's just kind of as a backup besides being in maintenance or, say, training? Or are they always essentially maximally scheduled as much as they can? Yeah, they are maximum schedule on these <laughs> sorts of things. We, we call this asset contention. There's always more spacecraft than there are antennas to communicate with them. So we've built techniques over the years to actually increase the capacity on antennas. We okay. use a system called multiple spacecraft per aperture, MSPA. So if you have a spacecraft, say Mars, there are 13 missions there yep. right now, your beam width well, it's, it's the Mars, is yeah. larger than the planet. That's so right. you can see four spacecraft at exactly the same time ah. and bring down data from those four simultaneously. That helps to build up the extra capacity. In there. Now, are they operating on the same frequency then, or are they operating on different frequencies? that you Different have to... frequencies, different bit rates. Yeah. So you have to have the system capable to be able to interpret all of those different signals coming in at simultaneously and to process it. We can also uplink at the same time okay. with that system. But because it's at least in the same point, and as you said, your beam will cover that area, yeah. you can do multiple. But I imagine this provides tricks into some of the other spacecraft that are purely by themselves that that's it. Yeah, and of course, every science team wants to us, has us <laughs> talk to their spacecraft 24-7. Yes, yes. But you can't do that. Not enough antennas, not enough time, too many other missions out there. So you do have to allocate time. Sometimes missions might be just, they need a couple of hours to get yep. an uplink signal, get a little bit of data back. Sometimes it might be eight or nine hours for some spacecraft that need total coverage. And at the moment, Mars, because it's the busiest place in the solar system, we literally call it the traffic jam of the solar system <laughs> with 13 missions, that it gets, it's the only place in our solar system that gets 24 hour coverage through the network. Oh, wow. So, so somewhere on that network at any given time, there is a receiver pointing at Mars. Pointing and doing work with Mars. And of course, Mars, planet similar to ours, rotating and so forth. You've got spacecraft on different sides of the planet. You've got to wait for, say, a rover to come into daylight yep. so that we can see it on this side of the Earth as well. So it makes it busy and tricky. Yeah, it is a complicated planet to deal with, but it's one of the most exciting places that we deal with because you've not just got our orbiting missions, missions flying somewhere, you've got vehicles on the surface of a world yep. and getting the data back from those is extra exciting <laughs> because of the vision that they provide. <laughs>